Shalom and welcome to this edition of Revealing the Truth, where we cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. I'm your host, the Reverend Rabbi Eric Walker, author of the released, number one released Messianic title, uh, The Seven Laws of Abundant Living, Lessons Learned from the Tree of Life. Get a copy for yourself and see and hear and read about the life-changing lessons contained in that book in My Journey to Faith. And talking about the Jewish journey to faith, we are very pleased to have Susan Perlman with us, who is one of the executive directors of Jews for Jesus from California. Susan, welcome to the program. It's so good to be with you, Rabbi Walker. Uh, Susan, you and I have seen each other at conferences. We've seen each other at events. And we know who we are. We know our identity as Jews. We live a Jewish life. We were born as Jews. We were raised as Jews. We live as Jews, but we believe in Jesus. The world looks at Jews for Jesus and scratches their head and says, well, that doesn't make any sense. Either you're Jewish or you're Christian. Let's start with the total unraveling of the concept of a Moish Rosen and a vision for who, what, where, and how Jews for Jesus. Well, I, I uh, got to meet Moish Rosen, the founder of Jews for Jesus, for the first time uh, in a telephone call um, while I was uh, living in my hometown of New York. Uh, and he was already in California as the beginnings of the Jews for Jesus modern day movement were starting. Um, I had been a believer in Yeshua for about a year at that time, and I can share a little of my personal journey with you that led me up to that point. Um, I grew up in Brooklyn, uh, which was the second Holy Land as far as I was concerned. Everyone around me was Jewish, all my neighbors, all my school teachers, uh, all my friends. Um, and uh, I, I mean, I, I, it wasn't until really till I got into high school that I realized that the whole world wasn't Jewish. Um, and uh, I always felt very secure in my identity as a Jew. Both my parents are Jewish. Uh, their parents uh, immigrated here from Eastern Europe. Um, I was uh, taken care of as a little kid by my uh, great uncle who only spoke to me in Yiddish. And so when I began public school in the United States, I had kind of a European accent. And, um, and the, the, I remember the teacher telling my mother, you know, um, we're going to be, you know, um, patient with your daughter since she's not a native um, American and I <laughs> and my mother smiled and said no no she's born right here um, but uh, uh, I um, I didn't think about um, my Jewish um, identity as being something uh, to question or my religion as a Jew to question until uh, I reached the age of 12 at that point my dad died very suddenly of a heart attack and I um, as is traditional in Jewish homes, our family uh, sat shiva for a week. That means we had a week of, of uh, mourning in the home. Um, and our family rabbi came and visited. And I remember asking him a very compelling question for me. I said, is, is my daddy in heaven now? And uh, the rabbi paused, he didn't have an answer right away, and then he said, well, Susan, his memory will live on in you. If you live a good life, it will be credited to him. And I was a precocious enough 12-year-old to not take that answer as uh, satisfactory, and I said, but rabbi, you didn't answer my question, is my daddy in heaven? And he said, well, we, we can't know for sure what lies beyond the grave. We can only hope, and your father was a good man. Now, I didn't actually process that and analyze that as a 12-year-old, but I think in my mind I recognized that somehow the rabbi should have had a better answer than that one to tell me if there was a heaven or not. And, uh, and so while I never really um, thought that my my Jewishness was uh, in in, in uh, um, is was suspect in any way. 
I did, I did think that my following the Jewish religion as such was something to question because I should have better answers about such important questions when it comes to life and death. Um, uh, I kind of packed that away, and then um, after a university, and I uh, studied communications um, at Hunter College in New York City. Um, I landed a job as a copywriter in an ad agency in the city. Um, I managed to get through the first 20 plus years of my life without anyone ever sharing the gospel with me, telling me about Jesus, Yeshua, who he was. Um, and I, I didn't feel like I was missing anything. Right. Uh, and then, uh, then Rabbi, I, I, I met a, um, a Christian on a street corner in Manhattan. He was blonde-haired and blue-eyed, and what my picture of a Christian would be, because he was a Gentile, he wasn't Jewish. And uh, he was wearing a button that said, Smile, God Loves You. Now, this was at the height of what was then called the Jesus Movement in the United States. A lot of young people were coming to faith in Yeshua, and uh, I had read about this in an article in Time magazine. And so I put two and two together and I said, excuse me, but are you one of those like Jesus people that I've been reading about? And he said, well, you, you could say that. And I said, well, actually, what is it that you all believe? And I know that there might be some um, people watching this that will say, oh, I wish I had that experience of having someone like you stop me and ask me that kind of question. Um, and he was quite excited to answer it. And he said, but it's very noisy here on the street. Can we go into the, there was a coffee shop really close by. And so we, we went in, I went into this coffee shop with a perfect stranger, but I was a, a pretty gutsy New Yorker. I didn't think much about that. And, uh, and then he went ahead and shared with me the gospel that Jesus came and died for my sins and rose from the dead. And that by, confessing my sins, I could have new life and um, forgiveness. Um, and I listened and I was very polite. And then I said, thank you for explaining that. But you see, I'm Jewish. Now, I thought when I said I'm Jewish, he would probably apologize for having tried to, quote, convert me. But um, instead, he said, oh, I think that's great that you're Jewish. And I was puzzled by that response. He said, well, you know, my savior is a Jew. And the New Testament was written by Jews. Now, I, I suppose I, I knew that theoretically, but um, I somehow thought of Jesus as the God of the Gentiles and the New Testament as their, their Bible, their book, nothing to do with us Jews. And so um, I was a bit intrigued, and he then told me he was going to be uh, doing a concert, a music concert in a, a church nearby, and he invited me to come with him. Uh, turned out he was a very famous folk um, singer uh, at that time by the name of Larry Norman. And, uh, and, uh, and I did go with him, not because I was spiritually uh, hungry, but... Um, uh, I just thought he was really nice, and I thought it won't hurt me to go with him. I, I'm not obviously not going to be influenced um, to consider what he's saying, but you know, we'll go out. It's like a date, and um, and so I did go, and I I heard other people share their stories of how Jesus had changed their lives, and then people started praying for me uh, from that night on, and. Uh, I believe God uses prayer, um, and for any of your listeners who um, have a, a, a very a full and healthy prayer life, man, pray for your Jewish friends, because it really does make a difference. And, um, and as people prayed for me, um, I came, I guess, under conviction. I started realizing that, you know, my life wasn't perfect anymore as I thought it was and and that actually I needed uh, what Yeshua Jesus had to offer and so it was shortly after that time that I made him my Messiah my, my Lord and um, and started walking as a, a follower of Yeshua but at that time I thought I was the only Jew in the whole world who believed that way 
So did you go home and tell your mom about your experience? Did you tell your friends about your experience? Well, I was uh, uh, living with roommates. I had moved out of my mom's place. I was living with roommates and um, I told them first of all, and they all thought that I'd gone bonkers, you know, that um, this was ridiculous, that I believed in Jesus. Actually, um, uh, one of them was Catholic and had grown up in going to Catholic schools all the way through college. And, and she thought that I had like, I had regressed. She thought as a Jew, I was much more enlightened mm -hmm. than to believe in Jesus. Um, I then um, didn't know how to tell my, my mom and the rest of my family. And I thought, well, you know, and this was maybe arrogant on my part or naive. I'm not sure which at the time. But I thought, you know, the reason they don't believe in Yeshua is no one's probably explained it to them well. And I just need to get them all together, sit them down and tell them. And so I let my family know I had a very important um, uh, announcement to make um, and that I needed them all together when I made it. And I think my mother might have thought maybe I was going to announce I was getting married or something like that. And instead... I had my mom and my two sisters and my grandmother, and I said, you know, I, I've made the most important decision in my life. Uh, I found out that Jesus is our promised Messiah, and I've given my life to him. Um, my mother, first of all, thought that meant I was moving into a convent to become a nun. Um, my One of my sisters felt like, you know, I needed to go see a psychiatrist. Um, my other sister, who was uh, a lot younger, was just kind of sad for me. My grandmother, um, who uh, was sort of the matriarch of our family, said to me, you know, I hope that God doesn't hold it against my sister Sarah for what you're doing. You see, Rabbi Walker, as you know, in, in Jewish homes, uh, we're oftentimes named after a a deceased relative, and my uh, my great aunt died um, as a young woman, and my um, mom named me after her. Sarah's my Hebrew name, Susan's my English name, and uh, and Jewish kind of superstition is that you know who, whoever you're named after, the good you do or the bad you do is kind of credited to them, yes. and so. My grandmother was very sad that this would be something that God would hold against her sister. <laughs> and uh, and so it was not the response I was hoping for. How did you, and of course, as we look at it, it's uh, a testing of our faith. It's We have made a decision and we're looking around and the people closest to us are not accepting that decision in one form or another. Uh, did you feel a falling away, or did you feel that this was even more convicting for you, and that that until you could tell a better story, a, a more compelling argument, be more of an example, that you still had the hunger and hope to reach them? I, I hoped that I could eventually reach them. My mother asked me to not share what I had told her with other family members that it would it would look like she hadn't raised me properly, that I'd come to this belief. And I remember saying to her, you know, I, I can't I can't agree to that. I'm I you know, I don't want to hurt you, I don't want to embarrass you, but um I can't keep my my faith silent. I I I have to I have to tell people about Yeshua, and I will do it in the most respectful way I can, but I can't keep it silent. And then I, I remembered also, I had not been reading that much of the Bible at that point, of certainly the New Testament, but um, I knew that Jesus said that he would never leave me or forsake me. Right. And I think that held me fast and sure to what had happened in my life, and I wasn't going to deny it. Um, it took quite a while for my family to come around, and they never came around to actually coming to faith in Yeshua yet, <laughs> but they came to accepting me as their daughter, their sister. Um, 
and uh, and recognizing that uh, my acceptance of Jesus as my Messiah uh, was not um, a rejection of my Jewish identity or my family affiliation, but it was a, it was actually um, an enhancement of it to me. And, and that's what I don't think people under really understand, that when uh, I, I came to faith at 44, 21 years ago, and I became more Jewish. How do you become more Jewish than, than immigrant parents, than uh, Yiddish, than reading Hebrew, than uh, being confirmed and all the things and living a Jewish life? How do you become more Jewish? Because your heart becomes more inclined to it. And... Uh, <clears throat> You know, as far as Shomer Shabbat being legalistic, I, I, would, I was not raised in a legalistic home. And Paul's very clear. He says, whatever condition you come into faith, uh, endeavor to maintain that position. So I didn't go all out and let my hair grow and pay out and, and start wearing black and, and, and wearing fringe because I didn't grow up that way. I grew up in a conservative Jewish home. Uh, I put on a kippah when I walked in the synagogue. I took the kippah off when I walked in the street. Why would I take on things that in, in biblical instruction says, don't do it. Don't, cha don't change who you are because those are all external. Let God circumcise your heart because he looks on the internal. So internally, I was more identified with my Jewish identity and the heritage of my family who died at Babiyar, my family that died in Odessa, my family that died in Budapest. It became more ingrained in me where just being a Jewish kid from Pittsburgh, I was surrounded by Jewish kids from Pittsburgh. What, what, you know, what was the big deal? It was Polakoff and, and uh, Rakoff, and, and they spoke Polish in their home, they spoke Russian in their home, we spoke Yiddish and Hungarian in our home. I mean, that was the world we lived in, the world you lived in. You heard, you heard uh, every name called when somebody was calling for their son, whether they were calling for uh, Yitzhak or for Bobby. It didn't matter. You, you knew the identity. Exactly. Uh, there's uh, so much confusion. Um, and part of that confusion is, is that there is this thing called the Great Commission, and it's actually become the Great Omission. And if it weren't for the fact that there was a Great Omission, Jews for Jesus might not even need to exist. But had the early church answered the call to the Jew first, had they heard Paul proclaim, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it's the power of God for salvation for all who believe, but to the Jew first, if we listen to the words of Jesus, go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. I didn't come for you, I came for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then our churches would have been built with the openness of embracing the fact that Christianity is Jewish. Yes. You don't stop being, uh, or you don't become someone else, you embrace the fullness of the Bible. Uh, but yet, Jews for Jesus gets labeled, as I have been, of committing spiritual holocaust. That what we are doing is we are denying and depriving our Jewish-born relatives of their true Jewish identity. But statistically, only about 10% of all Judaism is religious. Uh, Isaiah 53 is a number on a jersey, on a baseball, on a basketball team, and Jeremiah 31 plays for uh, the Detroit uh, Pistons. That's the meaning of the numbers and the letters, is there numbers on jerseys. There's, there's, I guarantee you, you throw a name and a number at somebody and you say, second baseman, New York Yankees. That's the whole connection between name and number. Uh, uh, and and it, it, it's quite hilarious because I felt that that, that way for 44 Rab years. Yeah, Rabbi Walker, an interesting thing that, has, that, that happened with our Jews for Jesus branch in Israel a number of years ago. We did, we did this as an experiment. We took out um, kind of uh, clipboards. We put Isaiah 53 in Hebrew 
you know, just the text, not right. in, in a Bible, just the text on a piece of paper. We had people read it and ask them, where did they think this was from? Um, and almost to, to the person, the answer was, oh, well, that's obviously from the New Testament because it's about Jesus. And they had no idea that that passage of Scripture came from the Tanakh, from the Hebrew Bible. Uh, it's it's shocking. You're, well, Jews for Jews is, is doing an extraordinary work. Uh, I think that the uh, uh, challenge in the world is style versus content. Uh, a lot of people don't like street evangelism, and because Jews for Jesus has effectively for a hundred years almost used street evangelism as a way to reach people, uh, <clears throat> that's not everybody's cup of tea. But from a content standpoint, it's an extraordinary organization. We're going to take a short break of talking with Susan Perlman. I want you to go to jewsforjesus.org and uh, click on uh, the About Ministry Facts. Uh, they are facing a $302,000 a year end shortfall. Uh, and time is running out and the gift has to be made by December 31st. <clears throat> there are only five ministries that I've ever mentioned by name, four of them in Israel, one of them here, uh, that I have ever mentioned on this program in asking you to give. And uh, I am asking you to give to Jews for Jesus and to consider it as part of your year-end gift. It's one of the reasons why I wanted to have Susan on. Uh, we are a station that covers authors, newsmakers, subject matter experts, and Susan is not only a subject matter expert, but <clears throat> uh, probably one of the world's leading authorities on Jewish evangelism, uh, from black eyes to being pushed down the street to being spit upon, to being called every name, and to have the chutzpah, the fortitude, the strength to press through all of that. And you're now celebrating how many years with Jews for Jesus? Um, I came to be with Jews for Jesus in 1972, and we actually uh, incorporated as an organization in 73. So uh, I don't know if you can do the math. It's been a lot of years, 40-something, 40 44, 40, 40, 45 40, years. 44 years. So the year... Um, it's it's uh, uh, extraordinary um, because uh, I came to I came to faith at age 44 when I first heard that Jesus was Jewish. Um, this is an organization. We're not talking about Messianic Judaism, which are congregational. We're talking about an evangelical, apostolic outreach to the world to the four corners of the world, on the busiest streets of the world, wearing a Jews for Jesus t-shirt and carrying a tract and engaging in congregations in places that you yourself, as a Christian, would wa not walk into Haight-Ashbury or into the inner city, into the places that Jews for Jesus goes. And when we come back from break, I'm going to have Susan tell you some of those stories. But in the meantime, go to JewsForJesus.org and find a way to make a gift and help them make their budget for 2017, going into 2018. We'll be right back. Bye. Shalom. I'm the Reverend Rabbi Eric Walker, Executive Director of Ignatica Nation and host of the daily TV program Revealing the Truth. Seen live every Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. Central Standard Time at www.ianbn.com and then replayed throughout the day and night via our website. All of our segments can be seen on the Igniting a Nation YouTube channel. Since our launch in January of this year, we've expanded our global reach to over 54 countries with a social media following of over 125,000. Our commitment is to bring you the most in-depth interviews with authors, subject matter experts, and thought leaders from around the world. We have interviewed guests from Israel, Brazil, England, India, 
and all across North America. All of our authors are featured on the Books and Media page on our website, www.ianbn.com. There you can find a direct link to the book you want to order, and we receive a small commission directly from Amazon. There is no cost to you for this service. In addition to our daily teachings and interviews, we make available to you the archive of all of the interviews on our YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram channels. Our live program is available from our homepage, and there is never a charge to you for any of this access. We made the decision long ago that we would remain a commercial-free resource that would not be influenced by any pressure from any outside company. There are only two ways that we are able to continue to operate this ministry and provide you with the only live, four-hour daily Christian television talk show program. The first is through your support and tax-deductible contributions to Igniting a Nation. These can be made directly through the donate button on the website or sent through the mail to Igniting a Nation, 2700 Corporate Drive, Suite 120, Birmingham, Alabama, 35242. The other way we support the program is by offering you a unique opportunity to have access to over 10 years worth of teachings on a subscription basis. The teaching archives contains all of my prior sermons, Torah studies, prophecy in the news videos, and much more for the low subscription price of $5 per month. This subscription grants you unlimited access to over 800 hours of content not available elsewhere and is updated weekly with the most current prophecy classes. In addition to 20 hours of original TV programming each weekday, we invite you to join us live every Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday evenings for our Prophecy in the News classes. The times and locations are listed on our events page on the website www.ianbn.com. Every day you and I are faced with the challenge of where we will go to hear the truth. We are committed to bring you the only program of its kind that covers the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. We cannot do this without your support. Since we launched on January 5, 2017, we have aired over 300 individual teachings, interviews, and commentaries not available anywhere else. We are now working side by side with almost every major Christian publishing house to bring you the most in-depth feature interviews possible. Our one-hour features address every subject that affects the believer's life. We are hearing of salvations from the Middle East, Africa, and all across the United States. Lives are being changed every day, and we have only just begun. Our mission is to become your trusted resource and grant you access to the people, tools, and information you need to grow in your relationship with the Lord. You can help us by liking us on social media and through your financial support. We know you have many choices in who you support, but we are prayerfully asking you to consider helping us keep revealing the truth, true to our calling, to cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth like no other program available. Donate today and help us bring the message to the four corners of the earth. Visit www.ianbn.com and donate, buy a book, or subscribe to our teaching archives. Without you, we do not exist. Shalom and welcome back to this edition of Revealing the Truth, where we cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. I'm your host, the Reverend Rabbi Eric Walker, and we're talking with Susan Perlman, uh, one of the executive directors of Jews for Jesus, a nonprofit whose entire vision is to reach the lost sheep of the house of Israel with the good news of the Jewish Messiah. Susan, welcome back to the program. Good to be back with you, Rabbi. Susan, I have met some who have trained, uh, who have come up through the ranks, young college students, excited, have a summer, want to be the summer in New York City, want to be the summer in Jerusalem, want to be the summer uh, event. Uh, and they come back with such incredible stories. And the most common story they came back with was how come I never heard any of this before? And, of course, my answer is, who is going to tell me? You know, I was 
like you, were very close to the same age. We were the first post-Holocaust generation. We're not baby boomers. We're the first post-Holocaust generation in the Jewish world. They look to us to repopulate the Jewish world. To, it was a different assignment than being an American-American. We had this vision of, of save Soviet Jewry. Then we had uh, Project Solomon and let's get the Ethiopian Jews home. And we were so causal in the Jewish world in trying to undo all the harm that had been done to us and to survive and remain as a community. Then comes along this divisiveness, and it was divisive, uh, that there was this thought that you could believe in the Jesus that killed my goodness, he was going to kill all the Jews in Spain because they weren't going to convert to Judaism. My goodness, they were going to kill all the Jews in Rome if they didn't accept Jesus. What are you talking about, Jesus? Why would you want to go to work or believe in somebody that tried to kill us? And so there was two Jesuses. There was a Jesus of history and there was a Jesus of the Bible. Well, as Jews, we didn't care. Jesus was the God of the Gentiles. We had our own God. So we didn't really care what you did. Okay? We had nothing to do with it, and we were fine with you having nothing to do with us. So what occurred to you in your 20s was quite radical because you're exposed now to unraveling the myth of the Jesus of history, which was mythology. There was no Jesus on a white horse leading the charge to kill the Jews. There was no instruction in the New Testament to kill the Jews. This was the zeal of fallen man trying to do what they thought that they were going to do, but the real Jesus was somebody completely different. How did you come to understand all that and like these young people, that's what they were so excited about. They got to tell the story of the real Jesus. And people would say to them, well, I never heard that side of the story before. Well, that's a good question. And uh, it, it was a process for me. Uh, I, I, I really had not um, uh, been uh, exposed to a whole lot um, other than I had a, a childhood friend who went to a parochial school and uh, she she was the first one to inform me that we, the Jewish people, had killed their God. We'd killed Jesus. And I remember asking my mom about that. And she said, well, that's what the Gentiles think we did. And, um, and that a lot of the persecution of our people throughout history um, uh, has happened at the hands of Christians, that the Nazis were baptized Christians, that... Um, all of these different events. And if you look at Jewish history books, um, they, they really are written and slanted in such a way that you would think that the whole Christian world is against us. Yes. Uh, but I then got to meet some real Christians who loved the Jewish people. And that really shattered some of those stereotypes for me. Um, people who've, who've looked at the, 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 pages of the Hebrew scriptures and saw my Bible heroes as their Bible heroes and saw Jesus as a God who loved the Jewish people. Jesus wept over Jerusalem. Um, Jesus uh, uh, did not um, encourage his followers to hate Jews. You know, like you said, um, he encouraged them to go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel first. And uh, certainly that was Paul's formula throughout the, the uh, establishment of uh, believing bodies in, in, in the first century. And so, you know, you, you, you think about it and realize that um, Christianity, yes, has been uh, maligned and has maligned the Jewish people at, some, at different points in time. But it was never the intent of Jesus, and it was never the intent of those Bible-believing followers who really loved the Jewish people. Um, and so I got the—I have had the privilege of meeting many um, who, you know, whose hearts break um, to see Jewish people, their neighbors, their friends, um, walking into a, 
a, a, a Christless eternity to them, that that's horrible, because they know Jesus's love for Jews is uh, boundless. And so, um, you know, when uh, when I spoke with Moish Rosen, our founder, um, originally about coming and being part of what was then the Jews for Jesus movement, you know, he told me that I could make a difference in, in sharing that message of his love. Um, and that there were others that were friends uh, of our ministry that w could get behind it. Um, I, I remember in the earliest days of Jews for Jesus, getting the opportunity to speak in, in different churches, to share my testimony, and to have people say, oh, I, I, I really want to help. Now, the, some of them gave uh, financially. Many of them gave with their prayers. Many of them had Jewish friends and wanted to know how better to share their faith with them. And we still, to this day, help people in, in those ways. I mean, our our main focus is the proclamation of the good news. Um, we feel like we can be the arms and the legs of, of many within the larger body of Messiah to get that message out to Jewish people. Because as Jews talking to other Jews, there's a certain credibility there. But also, we want to help equip those who love the Jewish people, who are believers, and how they can better uh, share their faith with their uh, work colleagues, with their neighbors. Um, we no longer live in Jewish ghettos, you know, and Jew Jewish people live alongside lots of non-Jews. And, you know, here in the United States where I live, 58% um, of millennials um, come from a single Jewish parent home. So they've had even more exposure to non-Jews and Christians or nominal Christians. And so uh, there's all kinds of opportunities there. As you began to grow spiritually, a deeper understanding of the message that was really quite simple to deliver, but when you put it into uh, Gentile Christian terminology, it requires an interpreter because, you know, I, I laugh with people and see these signs that say Jesus saves. And, and I say to them, not convincing. And they say, why not? I say, because a good Jewish boy would invest. <laughs> so if it says Jesus invests, I might say, huh, what does he invest? What kind of rate of return? The, just even the small things, uh, the concepts that the Jews killed Jesus. Imagine, first of all, that's completely a fallacy, not supported in Scripture. But try this one on for size. What would have happened if 2,000 years ago all the Jews accepted Jesus? Where would you be? And they stop and think. A non-Jewish person say, well, I guess I'd be where I was. Right. You were on the outside knocking to come in. So this was God's plan. And if it was part of God's plan, before you start calling me Christ killer, which I grew up in Pittsburgh, Catholic City, I was called a Christ killer. And then I sang in the Archdiocese of Pittsburgh underneath the statue of Jesus on the cross. So... I always thought it was motivation to sing on tune. Otherwise, they might do that to me. But <laughs> nevertheless, I didn't hear anything, not in uh, Cecil B. DeMille, not in movies, not in friends wanting to invite me to church, because they didn't speak a language I understood. Yeah. How, right. how have you found a way to bridge that gap of understanding? Well, one of the things that we started doing in the earliest days of Jews for Jesus and have continued to the present, and that is uh, we contextualize everything. We look to take um, the message um, of the gospel and make it relevant to, to us as Jews, you know, how we would receive it. So for even words like you say, like save or salvation, sin, savior, they're not as, as familiar to Jewish people as they are just warp and woof of what, um, 
you know, Christians uh, think of when they think of uh, the gospel message. And so we, we think about, you know, um, sin in a different way. For, for a Jewish person, sin is, you know, some lady of ill repute walking down the street. Uh, not the fact that anyone who is um, uh, outside of God's will, um, not giving him credit for who he is and, uh, you know, is, is in, a, in, in a real sense sinning. And so we don't differentiate between little sins and big sins and that kind of thing. So we try and explain sin as, you know, a, a separation from God, that God is totally holy. I remember when I started reading the Bible uh, before I, I accepted him, um, I, I started in Genesis because I didn't know where else to go. And I, I certainly wouldn't have opened a New Testament. But as I read in in in, in Genesis and and through the, the, the five books of Moses, I saw a very holy and righteous God. Mm-hmm a God who expected something of his people. Um, and, and on that basis, I realized, you know, I fell short. Sure, I didn't lie and cheat, and I wasn't an adulterer, and I didn't do those kind of things, but that wasn't enough. I, I saw a God who was so holy that I, I couldn't approach him on my own. And so we talk about the need for a mediator, you know, and, you know, and we have all kinds of examples of mediators in, in the Hebrew scriptures. And so you, you move from those points of familiarity, you know, and um, there's a there's a, a law um, that um, teachers use called the law of apperception. You teach that which is unknown from that which is known. And that's the, kind of the building blocks of sharing with someone, whether it's a Jewish person or someone who comes from the from a, the Muslim faith or Buddhist faith, they have a whole different set of understandings, and you just have to start with what they know, and then move from there. Um, and so we started in very basic things, like um, uh, one of our first gospel broadsides was entitled "Jesus Made Me Kosher." Now, every Jewish person knows what kosher means, and but how could Jesus make you kosher? It was a bit provocative. It, it kind of was a head turner. And then uh, as you read the pamphlet, you got to understand what it meant to be okay and made right and made clean. Um, and, uh, and we've done that, you know, throughout the years. Um, uh, we, we've, at the holiday season, like we are in right now, we have a, um, a postcard we, we hand out. It says, um, uh, um, without Hanukkah, there would be no Christmas. Now, that kind of will get someone thinking, huh, what do the two have to do with one another? But obviously, Hanukkah is, a, you know, was the way, you know, the story, the dedication of the temple, and it was the pr- preservation of our people that we could have been annihilated. But because we weren't, the Jewish people continued to exist, and the Messiah could be born from among the Jews, you know, hundreds of years later. So, um you know, we try and, 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 and speak to Jewish people from the frame of reference they understand. What's been uh, fascinating to me over the years of watching Jews for Jesus, equally as effective with the young high school, college, millennial, and older Holocaust survivor, uh, across generational lines, and I give you great credit for your screening and your training and you're preparing because you are mobilizing an army. I don't think people understand the length, the depth, and the breadth of the organization Jews for Jesus. And I want to encourage you. This is an American organization that very few people know anything about, but yet they have offices all over the world. Uh, They have a staff of well over 100. They're a long-established, a long-respected, much maligned, organization and the malignment comes from the Jewish community saying that you can't be Jewish and believe in Jesus and this is a mantra that's spoken throughout Israel saying a way of trying to deny us of our legal right of return Uh, I believe that you cannot uh, um, I, I couldn't be more Jewish 
I am uh, more Shomer Shabbat. I am more... Um, before I became a believer, I had not gone to Israel. Hmm. I didn't really have a desire. I was an executive of Hewlett Packard. I figured if they want an open office in, in Israel, they'll send me there and that'll be my trip. Well, I became a believer 21 years ago. I've made 16 trips to Israel. Uh, it's my heart. It's my people. Uh, I've made two trips to Odessa, two to Kiev, two to Auschwitz and Birkenau, to, to Budapest, to reconnect with my own people and my own family that are surviving. Uh, and uh, you do that every day by connecting people on the street. Uh, we're just about two minutes before we close. Uh, Susan, tell people how they can connect with you uh, through the website uh, and what to expect as they begin a relationship. You know, they're bombarded this time of year with giving requests, bombarded with information, slammed on Facebook and Twitter. That's not the style, although you'll get plenty of information. What will they get from you if they connect with you? If people would connect with us at our website, which is a great way to do it, Jews for Jesus, completely written out, dot org. Um, and, uh, and let us know, you know, that, um, they're a believer in Yeshua and they want help either in witnessing to their Jewish friends or more information about the Jewish backgrounds of their faith. Um, we will send them some material or send them some links to some material. We can send them our free uh, newsletter, either electronically or in print. Um, we can tell them about our branches in areas near them so that uh, they could hook up locally. Uh, we're in, in uh, 14 countries and 26 cities around the world, so we might be very close to where you are as you listen to this. Um, and I, I just offer a, a, a personal uh, tip, and that is um, Hanukkah is coming up very shortly. Um, Jews are used to, to, uh, uh, to sending out Christmas cards to their Christian friends to show respect for their holidays. Um, you might consider sending a Hanukkah card to your Jewish friend and using that as an occasion to start a conversation um, about the one who is the light of the world. I think it's an outstanding idea. Uh, there are so many resources on the website. Uh, there have been organizations that have been around for a long time that uh, you don't know what their theology is. The theology of Jews for Jesus, the mission, is my people perish for lack of knowledge. My heart's desire is that all of Israel will be saved. They don't go outside. It's like the Defense Department. Are they uh, defending the interior? They go out to fight battles. This is a singularity of purpose is to bring every person, every Jewish person, to the full knowledge of their Jewish Messiah. And what a wonderful benefit. Many Gentiles come into faith through this experience, through this exposure. But it is an organization that people have been beating on for almost 100 years. And they have risen up time and time again. And they do that because people like myself and others call for a cry to help them make up this $302,000 year in budget shortfall uh, by clicking on making my gift. Go to Jews for Jesus, click on the last tab, connect to get involved. You'll see it, a way to make a gift. Even the smallest of gifts, you don't know whether or not that that nickel or that dime or that dollar or that $25 you gave printed that t-shirt or that pamphlet that wound up in the hands of Sadie, who said yes to Jesus, and that her salvation was because you made a contribution to Jews for Jesus. Susan Perlman, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you, be gracious to you. 
May the Lord turn his countenance toward you and give you his peace and bless all the works of your hands and that of Jews for Jesus. Uh, happy Hanukkah to you. Uh, a Merry Christmas. Uh, whatever you celebrate and decide that you want to be with family and friends. Uh, if you're in Birmingham, call us. We'll have you live in studio. And uh, let's not let too many more years go by as, uh, until we reconnect. Amen. Amen. So we thank you for that. Susan Perlman and Jews for Jesus. That's JewsforJesus.org. We're going to take a short break, and when we come back, we'll bring you the next edition of Revealing the Truth.